technical difficulties. We have technical difficulties and our timeline is, countdown is a little behind. And I wanted to go live and he said, go live and we're live. Hello, hello to everybody. I have no idea who's in the chat because Andy won't let me see it today. But who's here? There's like 40, 53 people here. Yes, yes, but I did see something interesting. A special shout out to a Southern Virginia University student whose favorite biology professor is... My brother! Yes! So, howdy to everybody from Southern Virginia University. We're glad you are here. And if you have Professor Jared Lee out there, be sure to ask him what jog food tastes like. Yes, it was childhood cranks. And if he's traumatized and you can help pass on the traumatization from his older brother. <laughs> anyway, welcome. We're so glad to have you here joining us to talk about today's topic. Um, if you are new to a live stream, one of the things we like to have you do is to put a cue in front of any questions you have, and then we'll cue them up. We'll ask them throughout. But today we're going to talk about birth dates. What do you have to say about birth dates? Um, they happen. <laughs> I don't celebrate mine. You know, he does not celebrate his, which is great because I get off the hook. I never know what to get him anyway, so I never have to celebrate his birthday. <laughs> um, but birthdays are important. Um, they're one of the uh, endpoints to an ancestor's life. They help establish their relationships and their identity. And I probably should turn on the slides. There we go. <laughs> I had it up written in the ready room and forgot to switch it over. But um, a lot of us are looking for birth dates for our ancestors. Um, it helps us particularly when we have same name individuals to keep them a little bit separate. And so today we're gonna go through a series of tips and tricks of how we can go about looking for a birth date when we can't seem to figure out the birth certificate. Sorry, I'm fixing something for Devin because she needs something fixed so that she can see stuff nice and big. <laughs> Where are my notes, though? You took my notes. That's why I had that open that way. Oh, there was notes? Uh -huh. Just not on that slide. Oh, well. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> Thank you, dear. That's love. What's love got to do with it? A whole heck of a lot. All right, so let's talk about um, birth certificates and birth dates. And so what do you think the first thing we should do when we're talking about an ancestor um, trying to track down their birth dates. Figure out what you know first. I mean, you know, how, how are they really old? Like if you're just looking at your grandma, uh -huh. but for instance, you know that, hey, your grandma's older than you and older than your mom mm -hmm. or your dad. Mm -hmm. So if you know how old your mom and your dad is, your grandma's got to be around tw at least 20 years older than that. Right. Maybe more. So, yeah. you know, you can start with something like that and figure roughly right exactly um i helped a young man who knew nothing about his parents um he was raised by his grandparents and so we started talking about building his family tree and we had to start with some educated guests what how old was your mom when she had you and he's like she was a teenager okay and how much older do you is did your grandmother say she was than your mom about 20 years. All right, so then we figured out how many years is that, Math Master? Uh, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. 20 Te years? Teenage plus 20. 35. So that could give you a starting point. So we always want to start with an educated guess, and um, that's from personal knowledge. But when we work back in time, Miles Meyer, who's going to be part of the Family History Fanatics Research Conference on June 5th, and you're probably watching this after June 5th, Always check our website to find out what virtual conferences we're hosting. Go to familyhistoryfanatics.com slash conference and you should be able to find out the latest information. But Miles had the recommendation of do a couple of things to get a starting point for when your ancestor might have been born. Um, use siblings' birth dates as a clue if um, you have maybe a will and the will put everybody in order and then you know that child one was born in 1760, child two was your ancestor, and child three was born in 1764. Where would you suggest that child two, your ancestor, was born? 
paying attention. You're throwing off all these dates while I'm trying to read stuff. (laughs) And then you ask me a question. Okay. 1750, is that right? No, it's 1760 to 1764. 1764. It would be somewhere between those two dates. I I wasn't listening. I'm trying to do what you told me to do. I'm trying to have you participate. That's all right. Okay, we're not going to do comments today. (laughs) Nobody comment. She wants me to participate. Well, in any case, so siblings, you, um, there is a, a standard theory. And as Andy talked about in other videos, he used it as a guideline, not in hard and fast rule, but children tend to be born every two years, but some women are super women and pop them out every year. So if you have a child, an older sibling born in 1760, and a, yeah, the younger sibling was born in 1764, then you could start with 1761 or 62 as a likely birth year for your ancestor. <laughs> The other thing you could do is look at your parents, the parents' birth dates and work backwards. You can also look at the parents' marriage dates. Typically, but not always, the child is born, the first child is born within nine months to two years after a couple gets married, they'll have their first child. But in some places, they actually have their official wedding after the child is born because they live in areas with circuit court judges or uh, ministers that come around every so often. So don't let them fool you with that. There could be some children born a little bit earlier and there could be some legitimate re- uh, reasons why other than nefarious reasons. So that's what you want to do. Start with an educated guess. Now, the next thing you need to do is you may be thinking, I can't find a birth certificate online. And a number of my colleagues had recommend you can't find them online because you're not using good search strategies. So my friend, um, the Family History Hound, Ellen Thomas Jennings, I just always know her as the Family History Hound. I always have to look up what her real name is. <laughs> anyway, she says that sometimes when we are using online search forms, we're putting too many terms into the forms and we're not getting back the results we're looking for. And so her recommendation is to try a less is more approach. Other things we can do is spelling variations. And my surname is Geisler, and it's spelled G-E-I-S-Z-L-E-R for our branch. But (laughs) that name has appeared like 17 different variations. And if I just get stuck that it has to be spelled with a G-E-I and there must be an S-Z, then I'm going to actually miss out one time it was spelled with a K and a double S. And you would think, well, that's Kessler. Well, it actually was Geisler, and it's pronounced with a hard German uh, KG combination sound. And so I missed, you could miss that if you're using online searches and not using those spelling variations. Another thing is maybe your ancestor has a birth certificate, but not in a location you think it's supposed to be. Throughout history, boundaries changed. And sometimes because of geographical issues, there could be a river, a mountain, or some other land feature that is preventing your ancestor to go to the typical place to register a birth. And you have to cross that boundary and they're not going to. So they are going to find the path of least resistance and go report their birth somewhere else. So I recommend that you get a map and you look at those boundary changes as well as geographical features and think not like a lazy ancestor, but an ancestor who doesn't want to put too much effort into, let's take my child in and report that they were born because they have lives that how of us really like to go to the DMV. I mean, come on, right? So look for boundaries. There's bound to be somebody that likes to go to the DMV. And I'll tell you, no, sorry, side note. But before we, you can side note after we explain what a DMV is. That's what I was going to explain as my side note. Oh, good, because I didn't want some of our international folks to go, what the heck's a DMV? So, DMV is Department of Motor Vehicles, unless you're in a different state that calls it the MVD, which is in New Mexico, the Motor Vehicle Department, Uh or there's something else. 
there was another state that used some other acronym yeah. that had D or V or M or whatever, but they're all <laughs> the exact same thing. It's where you go to get your driver's license. Mm -hmm. It's where you go to register your car here in the United States. Yes. And it's a state level, but administered by the county. But anyway, so um, your ancestors, they don't want to take a lot of time out of their day just to go to report at birth. The BMV. BMV. But that sounds like... The Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Bureau of Motor Vehicles. But that sounds like BMW. DVLA. Oh. John Tyner, DVLA. What does DVLA stand for, John? And John is from Ireland. So yeah. That'll be interesting. A little international trivia. Very good. Okay, so while he's typing that in, um, the next recommendation for searching for birth certificates is to use wild cards. So this is that asterisk to replace multiple letters or a question mark to replace a single letter. And in a number of databases, it doesn't really matter where you put it. You can put them at the beginning, middle, or end of a name, and that could help you find it. It could just be buried a little bit deeper. In Missouri, they have the Department of Revenue. You just, you basically go to the tax office, which is the Department uh, of Revenue, which some people might call the tax office. Right. How confusing <laughs> do we have to make it all across the United States? Well, not just the United States, around the world. Okay. <laughs> we have the AA, the Automobile Association in Ireland. Okay. But he's heard of the DVLA. Okay, very good. And AA <laughs> reminds me of AAA, which is what you call when your car breaks down and they leave me stranded for two hours because they're busting up a prostitution ring rather than coming and getting me stranded on the side of a highway. Yeah, that's a long story. <laughs> All right, so the other strategy when you're looking online in online databases is don't get hung up on the ancestor must have been born in 1761. Because they could have been born in 1760. They could have. Or 1762. See, I'm participating. Now. Good job. I'm proud of you. <laughs> but I have also seen where people have transposed dates, and so you really are looking for 1726, but an insector actually transposed it into 1762. So sometimes you just have to do a shot in the dark and see what comes up, and sometimes you get lucky and like, oh, yeah, that index was wrong. And on family search, some record collections you actually can help fix. In Ancestry, you can add it in some collections. You can add an alternate to the index, which is kind of nice. It makes it searchable from there and on out. But um, expand your ranges, your date ranges um, a little bit. Uh, don't ever assume you know what you think you know, but give it a try. All right. So those are some strategies, first thing. And this is your favorite topic to talk about, and that is birth certificates. Mine? It is. When we talk about records, especially vital records, you always stress oh. that they're modern documents. That's right. You do. In some cases, they are less than 100 years old. Yes. Which, when you think, you know, nowadays, the birth certificate, you use the birth certificate for everything. You know, if you get your passport, you have to turn in your birth In fact, story. Story time. <laughs> yes. Tangent. <laughs> yeah. Tangent. We're going off. Uh -huh. So, this is when I was... 18, 19 or so, I needed to get a, I was getting a passport. And here in the United States, you know, you go to the post office to get a passport, which, you know, goes along with everything else and so what we're talking about. But in any case, you bring all the, your documentation, you have your form filled out, and one of the pieces of information that you need is you need your original birth certificate. You know, the, the stamped, sealed, <laughs> embossed thing or whatever. So... Um, birth certificates is funny, you know, they're issued by the county or whatever, and they're just a piece of paper. And this is a piece of paper that you're supposed to keep with you and protect for your entire life, but you can't modify it in any way. It's just like your social security card in the United States. It's this little piece of flimsy paper mm -hmm. that you cannot modify. In other words, you can't laminate it. You which would help it yeah, preserve. Which would help preserve it. Especially if you live in Tornado Alley or Hurricane Alley. But, uh, yeah, so you can't, you know, do anything that's actually going to protect it, but you have to have it with you for any job, you know, all sorts of stuff. So you, you do this with your birth certificate. And so I have my birth certificate from when I was born. Um, and at some point in, you know, the 15 years that... that uh, I was alive, that my mom was in charge of my birth certificate, she had glued it to a, um, not a piece of cardboard, but a piece of like cardstock. 
So it was a little firmer. It wasn't just a flimsy piece of paper that could be destroyed really easily. Um, now it still had the embossed seal, and this wasn't just a stamped seal, but like the the raised embossing thing or whatever. So you could actually feel that it was was embossed. So anyway, I got grilled by the people at the post office because they're like, "Well, who put this on there?" I'm like. I don't know. I'm assuming my mom because this is how, you know, she gave it to me. Why did she do that? Why, why would I know that? Exactly. Well, you're not supposed to change your birth certificate. I didn't do anything to my birth certificate. Well, we need a, an, 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 an altered copy of your birth certificate. This is the only thing I have. So they eventually, you know, took it with a skepticism and said, well, we'll send it off to the State Department and see what they have to say. <laughs> And I'm just thinking to myself that, oh my gosh, my mom has ruined my life <laughs> by pasting my birth certificate to a piece of cardstock. And that is like a federal crime or something. So. They are modern. <laughs> yeah. Very modern. Um, and they were, and that's just the thing that about this is not only are they modern, and this is with all, ge all genealogy documents, mm -hmm. none of these things were ever meant to be genealogy documents. No, no. None of these things were meant to be half of the things that we use them for now anyway. Right. Which brings me to the next step or the next tip, and that is to know the laws and customs. So um, Trace is a professional genealogy company, and they have this to say. There are states which provide exceptions, laws, and compliance to the, late, the law for state-level birth registration, but it didn't occur until between 1910 and 1920. So particularly in the South, where I've learned this from people I've interviewed for this channel doing Southern research, that a lot of Southern states did not begin um, recording birth, marriage, and death until the 19 teens. So there really aren't any birth certificates. So you're going to want to know some strategies to what to do after that. Um, some cities or counties uh, recorded vital registration much earlier, but not many did not have a mandate to register every birth. And so sometimes you're looking at a birth register, a record or a register. Canada had these really cool registration forms. They're slightly different than the ones in the United States. I love looking at the ones in Ontario. Um, but in the United States, you could have a county where you're like, why is my my ancestor not record? The older siblings recorded, the younger siblings recording, but not my child, my ancestor, my sibling of the crew, because it wasn't required. And so remember, your ancestors weren't necessarily lazy, but they might not have been able to get around to it. And so it didn't get recorded. So those are some of the things you need to keep in mind when you're looking for birth certificates. But if you have exhausted all of those strategies or you're in this category where birth certificates weren't created, particularly if you're researching in a culture that never really kept documents, they're an oral tradition culture, what do we do then? Well, before we tackle that, make sure that you're putting Q in the question, uh, the comment section. So there, there is a question, Andy can find it and he can ask me about it. But let's talk about alternative sources for birth date information. Now over on our blog, if you go to familyhistoryfanatics.com slash blog, it will be there. And the blog is find an ancestor's birth date when no certificate exists. And I have come up with a list of 22 alternative sources for finding birth dates, even birth years. But I wanna play a little game with you. I want to see what you guys have used to come up with birth date information when you don't have a birth certificate. So this is the other caveat. I want you to put AS, meaning alternative source. Don't put two S's. I don't want you to call me a bad name. Anyway, I want you to put AS and then tell me your alternative source of where you look for birth date information when you can't find a birth certificate. So what kind of comments, there, the chat is flying. What's going on in the comment section? Oh, um, well, they want to know if my mom was arrested. Um, <laughs> well, no, and the end of the story for everybody who's not go. reading the chat is uh, the I was issued a passport. Um, obviously, the State Department was not as concerned about a piece of cardstock being pasted <laughs> to the back of this. And, and, and what's the, here's what's funny, okay? Here's what's really funny. In 
in the United States for our international our international viewers because I know in some countries it's all standardized as far as birth certificates birth registrations and I think I think England um, the United Kingdom is one of those in the United States it's issued your birth certificate is issued by the county mm -hmm. there are more than 3,000 counties in the United States mm -hmm. which means you can get a passport from any post office anywhere in the country and if you move around like my family has there's you're not even you know going to the same county <laughs> to get this so there's literally 3,000 variations that you could possibly have mm -hmm. so there's no way that any of these people even know what a birth certificate from Lynn County Iowa looks like <laughs> This is, probably the, this is probably the first time they've ever seen one. Okay. You know, mine was from Alameda County, California, but I got my passport in... Um, Utah? No. No. Missouri? No. New no. York? Houston. Oh. Um, in, uh, yeah, in Houston, Texas. So Does Houston, down. Texas know how, what, what, what it looks like from Alameda County? No. Do they know what it looks like? And that's, and that's just not the only thing. There's 3,000 counties, but then, of course, they change their form over time. Yes. So not only do you have 3,000 variations of a birth certificate, but you have 3,000 times, let's say they've changed it 10 times over that time. You've got 30,000 different ways that this birth certificate could look. It's like the, nobody at the post office knows whether this is real or not. Nobody at the State Department knows whether it's real or not. I could probably make up a birth... I'm not a forger, not but like I could probably make up a birth certificate that would be accepted. I don't know. But All now right. that I've just said that I'm going to commit a federal crime here... No. Um, you said you could. I could. You would. I'm not going to. <laughs> You're I could. Going to. All right. So while you have been thinking of alternate... Oh, wait. Sorry. A bunch of alternate sources Oh, now. good. Okay. So when I finish... When I finish as you're telling the story, all the alternate sources come in. Yes, Because we're on a like 10-second delay, so. Well, and that was the reason why I wanted you to share the story. All right, so, census. Yes. Family Bibles. Yes. Catholic Church baptism records in Yay. Mexico. good job. I have no clue what this is. Them Libbles. Ooh, Russell, tell us what that is. Yeah, Russell Furrier, tell us what Them Libbles is, or if you misspelled it, Ten. then, then uh, spell it correctly, I guess, or, or tell uh, your... <laughs> <laughs> autocorrect to stop autocorrecting. <laughs> a wedding certificate. I'm really, I really want to know what a fem level is. <laughs> a wedding certificate, a death certificate, a death record, phone listings, hmm. gravestone dates. I want to hear more about this phone listings. Uh, maybe that's what fem levels is. Just autocorrected into fem levels. <laughs> uh, parents marriages. Okay, yeah. Family books, obituaries. Um, obituary, parish church records, mm -hmm. county records, uh -huh. men, the selective registry, selective service or selective registry form, mm -hmm. the 1939 register over in the UK. Yes. There's a good one for people that are there. A will or a probate. Uh huh. Marriage certificates, draft records. Yeah. All right. Good job. You guys are hitting a number of the ones that I do have mentioned on the. Um, blog post. I want to make sure you go check that out later. But uh, newspapers, so I did see people say obituaries. I don't know that I heard you say birth announcements in the newspapers. And the other thing is, um, so that you have obituaries, but anniversaries or um, memorials. So sometimes somebody gets an award and then they have their biograph biography featured in and then that birth date could be there. So don't limit yourself just to obituaries and newspapers. Look for birth certificates, I mean, birth announcements and other featurette type articles. Um, one thing I did want to point out is in birth announcements, sometimes the child isn't listed by their name. A lot of times it's under Mr. Let's pretend we had it. I mean, we did have kids. But our kid was announced Let's in the newspaper. Let's pretend we had kids as opposed <laughs> to the ones we really had. But then we put the, we didn't really put the newspaper announcements in. We were pretty cheap when we were having our kids. Anyway, so um, it would appear as Mr. Lee welcomed a baby girl, and that would be it. So sometimes you got to get really creative when you're using the newspapers. So sometimes you just have to browse. Darn it. <laughs> 
All right, so another one, I heard some people say church records. Good job for you. We do have um, Catholic baptistry registers and I, that we did a video about the collection that's on Find My Past. Make sure you check out that video on our channel. Just type in Catholic, baptism, family history fanatics in Google, you'll find it. Sorry, I just, just yeah. going back, this, no, the Kelly Kelly and I have been having a little good conversation okay. back my birth certificate. And this is one thing I'm wondering, so. Did we find out what the Fim Libel was yet? Not yet, I haven't okay. seen what Fim Libel is um, yet. So, you know, like I said on my birth certificate, you could feel the, the raised embossed seal on it. And Kelly's like, yeah, that's what they, they care about. Um, because I guess, you know, back 30, 40, oh, this was 40 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, when I was born. Um, that was like high tech technology to, to make that, that raised part of the, the paper. Except that the thing that I wonder, and I'm sure this has happened, is you, you're keeping this birth certificate, you know, all your life. And so for 20 years, where is this birth certificate sitting before you need it to get a job or to do this? Well, maybe you put it in, um, you know, a bunch of file folders and it starts to get compacted together. I'm sure there's people that originally had a embossed seal, and now that that embossing has been smashed back flat. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe somebody said that. Now, uh, somebody mentioned about the birth certificate, and this is this is Robert, Robert Bell. He says that the Motor Department of Motor Vehicles, our DMV, uh, and I'm not sure what state, would not accept his wife's birth certificate from Los Angeles County because someone had put a pencil mark on the original. Yeah, this is this is how crazy, you know, birth certificate documents and and the sacredness of them are in the United States. Is you you do anything to it, mm. and you you violated the sanctity of that birth certificate, even though that birth certificate was never meant to be the be all end all of who you are. It was a paper that they have to file the you know the hospital has to file with the county that's for what, health statistics. For health statistics, and that's all they care about. Yes. <laughs> well, anyway, sorry, this is fun. Yeah, it is fun. And we do want to take a quick, I see some green oh, channel Oh, ah, numbers. Fim Bible. Wait, wait, Family wait. Bible. Oh. That makes a whole lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I Estate hope. Library Records. Yeah, okay. See? Family Bible. Okay, that makes Fimbible. sense. Fim Bible. Fim Bible. Can you welcome our new channel members? Yes, I can. Uh, Safi Ergen and Anna Hart, welcome as our new channel members. And just as an announcement, you always want to check the um, community tab on YouTube because that's when you're going to find out when Andy or I go live with our bonus member only uh, presentations. One happens to happen tomorrow, but we have lots of videos exclusive to channel members only. So back to alternative sources that I came up with. Um, I did mention that somebody's mentioned the Catholic uh, records, but for me, it was really exciting that Ancestry released the German Lutheran Church records, and the collection begins back from 1500 to somewhere in the 1900s. I don't have it pulled it up um, from memory. Um, but when I tried to find an early, early, early birth, I kept getting just the death records. <laughs> so I don't know what I was doing wrong. Anyway, so the one you have on the screen here before he hops back and yeah, the next shares one, some... You're going to show it next. Somebody, oh, okay, somebody good. guess the next one. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> is that uh, this one is from the... Okay, so you got to pull out your German skills. The German? town? Oh, uh, oh, Niedersteinach. Yeah. I, I took German in high school. I, I can speak that. Niedersteinach. <laughs> From 1812, at Baptism Records. Now, Baptism Records sometimes will also have a birth date on it. It isn't a requirement, but be very careful when you're looking at Baptism Records and don't assume a child is being baptized because sometimes adults are being baptized. So that's my one little caveat with that. Um, if there isn't a birth date along with the baptismal date, be very careful. Find out if it is an adult baptism or not. All right, so somebody guessed our next one that I wanted to highlight. And so before before you go on, just okay. going back to this this tangent that I'm on, I want to know from from our international people from Canada and England, Ireland, and Ireland, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if there's people from Germany and Sweden on, but is the birth certificate as sacred in your country as it is here in the United States? Do you need it for your driver's license and your passport and all this other stuff, or is it just like you know the school certificate of 
hey, you read three books this semester, <laughs> and you file it away in your scrapbook or, or whatever. Um, you were born! That's basically all. I just want to know, because I just get the feeling that here in the United States, they're, this is it. You don't have a birth certificate. You're nobody. Yeah. All right, so the next one I wanted to feature here was unique because I actually indexed this collection before. I mean, I didn't index the whole thing. I helped index over on Family Search school records. And this one is actually from Muskogee, Oklahoma from 1924. And on screen, you should be able to see that there are one, two, three, four kids, and then they have their date of birth and age at the time that this record is completed. And this was filed so that the kids could go to school and it's made available over on Family Search. There's some other state archives that have school records. Um, this tip also, I have to give a shout out to Melissa Barker, the archive lady, who reminded me of this collection. And I was like, oh, that's right. I keep forgetting about that collection. Now, not every state kept such records. I know in Franklin County, Ohio, I've looked and looked and looked and they don't have anything comparable. If they do, it's buried in an archive with an archive Grinch. Okay, maybe not a Grinch, but we can't get those records. Um, I've been told by other researchers you can't get those for Franklin County. But if you have access to those, those are pretty handy. I also saw people say college and university records might also have um, birth dates as well. So that was a good call from our audience. You guys are with it. All right, now speaking of our with it audience, and I don't know why Andy ran away, but that's okay. Um, I discovered this one from people like you. Um, there was someone in our audience who had a, written a story and shared it with me and we used it as far, far as our writing dive workshops for our member only training. And her relative Sorry. was from the uh, England and was part of the British home school that went over to Canada. So they were put in orphanages and they were sent over to Canada. And in the um, Canadian archive, there is an index to those records. And it doesn't actually have a date on the index. But here we have Joseph Alfred Rogers, and he's about eight years old. And it's said when this record was created. Now, it there on the website, I actually chopped off part of it, there is a um, some handy helpful links that tell you how you can actually order those records and if you have had experience with this let us know in the chat um, but you can actually use this information to try to track down those original papers and then the birth date might be in there recognize sometimes the children were brought to them and they didn't really know when they were born um, so it's a guess but it gets you something that people are utilizing in their record collection. And I thought it was a great source that few of us have ever talked about. So you had a one more thing. Well, no, uh, interesting thing you were talking about, the Oklahoma records there. Um, Tiffany's family mm -hmm. is from Oklahoma, and they are in those school records. Way cool. Um, dude, have a question from Monica about where you would find school records for a Texas school district. Good question. So you would go over to Family Search and go over to the Family Search Wiki and then navigate to the county that you're looking for. The records would be held at the county level. And then once you get there, then see in the Family Search Wiki, you can also look in the card catalog, do the same process, find out Harris County, for instance, see if they have school records. And if they do, in the card catalog, they'll give you links to either the collection that's held in Salt Lake City or an online collection that you can access. And then if um, it's not in the card catalog and it's on the wiki and they know where the collection is hiding, um, volunteers will have put that information on there. Just because it's not there on the Family Search wiki or the catalog doesn't mean it doesn't exist. At that point, then you would start looking at the state archives or count, contact county archives for Texas say, hey, did anybody keep the school records for Harris County from 1920? And if so, where's that located? And what are the privacy laws? How far back can I begin researching in those? So that's where I, I would always start a family search wiki and card catalog, then go to state archives, then go to county archives and proceed from there. So going back to our birth certificates in Canada at least we got okay. some we got some conflicting information in Canada okay um, it's some of the people are saying 
that basically you need your birth certificate for everything in Canada too. They're okay. as crazy there as they are here in the United States. Oh, which might be a you know we're cousins. We're it's cousins, okay. and so that's that's probably why. Um, on the and to, there's a couple of things here. So Lynn has a story here that her mom was born in 1941 in Victoria, BC, uh-huh. and she used the paper birth certificate that her father was given all of her life. When she was 70, she was told it was invalid. <gasps> So, 70 years she's been used in this thing for whatever she needs to in Canada, and now it's invalid all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Um, but, on the flip side, Eve says, I didn't have a birth certificate until I was in my 50s. Quebec okay. only had a baptismal certificate, which was a huge piece of paper. I'm guessing, you know, <laughs> something like this. I'm going to take my diploma frame <laughs> everywhere I go. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, dear. But that's Cosmic Slice says she's never had to use her birth certificate in Canada either. And so that's why I say there's some conflicting uh, mm-hmm. conflicting bits of information there. Interesting. Maybe there's parts of Canada where they're just like the U.S. There's somebody that, you know, got grief because their mom laminated theirs. Uh-huh. She's from Ontario. And it's like, that sounds like completely something that in the U.S. would happen. If yeah. I'm trying to preserve my birth certificate, so I laminated it. Oh, you are, <laughs> you've invalidated your birth certificate. <laughs> It's still yeah. the same thing. It just yeah. is not going to, you know, crumble when it gets wet now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, some other things you need to keep in mind is that sometimes um, there's delayed birth certificates. There's collections called delayed birth certificates. People got them later. Um, and sometimes birth certificates are wrong. <laughs> My grandmother has two birth dates. So she was adopted and under the name Marie Anderson, her birth biological name, her, her birth name, according to her birth mother, was Marie Anderson. And it said the 21st of May. But when she was adopted, some confusion happened because um, her mother died on the 22nd, the day after she was born. And the, bir- the adopted parents thought that, that she was born on the 22nd. And so that got put on her birth certificate for years and years and years. And she went to go get her social security or something. I don't know what. She's had three kids and she finds out she has two birth dates. Okay. Sorry, Denise. This is one of the most Canadian comments I've ever heard. Oh, <laughs> did she say A? No. Okay. No. Best place to keep those precious paper birth cert docs is in a plastic hockey card cover. Sweet. I love it. Good job. <laughs> y'all have hockey up there so that you'd think that, wait a second, we could use these to keep our birth certificates in and have them not be destroyed. And it's not laminated. And it's not laminated. Smart. And yeah. as genealogists, we well, would put it in an archive quality sleeve. So, but the thing that I'm thinking is, I, I collected baseball cards when I was younger. And so we had baseball card holders, but the baseball cards are, they're like, you know, two inches by four inches uh-huh. or three inches by four inches. They're not that big. So, um, and my birth certificate, now my birth certificate was like a half sheet of paper. Yeah. But I think for all of our kids, they're like a full sheet of paper. They're full now. sheet. Well, except one. One actually got two. A well, yes. little litty and a big, a big Yeah, one. a little one that was like a baseball card size. <laughs> and then we, you know, it looked like it was fake, really, because you could have printed it off of your computer. <laughs> we called them. Uh, what happened here? <laughs> and they're like, oh, that's so you can card around. Who cut to read your birth certificate? We've been told that it's like precious and you should never lose it. Why would you cart it around? Um, but Nick in Germany mm-hmm. says birth certificates are needed for passports mostly. Sometimes ID cards will be accepted. So my question is, is okay, so what do you do to get the ID card? Because I'm, I'm thinking here where we've used birth certificates. So you get the birth certificate at the hospital. Mm-hmm. Then you, I'm not sure if you had to show your doctor your birth certificate or that, but but anyway, to register for school, mm-hmm. your kids needed a birth certificate. Um, obviously, passports, driver's license. Um, insurance. Insurance. Getting married. Getting married. I don't think you need um, to get married. Yeah, like every time that I've, <laughs> I've changed jobs and gotten new insurance, mm-hmm. then we've had to show them all of the kids' birth certificates to prove that they're our kids. We have to show them our marriage. I mean, our marriage certificate is almost as sacred as a birth certificate, but not quite. It's more for her than it is for me. It's because pretty. it's because it is, it's how you show transfer of name or change of name. It's the legal document that shows us change of name for her. 
Um, but that was just for your social security card, really, that you needed to show that. Uh, no. Wait, oh, after, oh. oh, no Oh, story. that's true. That's true. When I got married, so my I have two middle names and a hard to spell last name. And people are like, oh, are you going to keep your last name when you get married? And you guys know what my last name is. It's Geisler, right? Anyway, I was like, heck no. I married him because his name is easy. Lee. Devin Lee. Done. I am dropping all those names, right? No problem. I went to the social security office and they're like, do you want all these names on your social security card now that you're married? And like, uh, can I drop any? They're like, sure. I'm like, okay, great. So I took one of my two middle names and I have my first name, one of my middle names and my married name and I'm good to go, right? <clears throat> was it New York? I think it was New York. So Texas had no problem, my social security card had no problem, driver's license, they said, you can have that name. I go to, no, I know what it was. I went to New York and they're like, hey, Texas driver's license, we don't need your, we don't care about your birth certificate. It says this name, we're gonna use it. I go to Iowa and because I have all these freaking names on my birth certificate, Iowa said I had to have all those dang names on my driver's license. When I moved to Texas, I said, can I have my old short name back? And they're like, sure. I'm like, yes. <laughs> New Mexico hasn't cared. So anyway, I, I, it's lovely to have last names. I mean, lots of names. As a geneolo genealogist, you're always going to know who I am. So I can't hide. But when you want to have a really short name on a driver's license, it's, it's a problematic. When, anyway. Yeah. That was my story. Did you catch up on comments? Uh, sort of, kind of, yeah. <laughs> I do have. I did find a couple questions that we need to ask. Okay, here. great. Okay, so we'll start with Anna here. Um, what about for slaves or their descendants? Okay, I know of slave registers and yep. slave owners' wills, uh -huh. but a lot of times there's no good information. Maybe an age and a gender, but no name. Uh -huh. Any other hints for that? Okay, well, it depends on the slave. Um, if you have slaves that were slaves for the Indians then you're going to have to look at the Dawes rolls, and they might have the dates there. Um, if you have um, formerly enslaved individuals, you might have to look. I mean, if they lived into 1900 and 1910, the census record gets you often um, the month and the year in those two, but not all of them. Or is it just one of them? I can't remember off the top of my head. I know it went a minute. <laughs> but um, so that might be the best you have. Which comes to my next point that I want to share real quick. Let me bring this up there, just so you see it as we're talking. Um, and then there's free, someone in the chat said the Freedmen's Bureau was a, a great source for birth certificate, uh, birth information. That was sometimes the first time any of their birth marriages and so on was recorded. So those are the places I would look if you have enslaved, formerly enslaved, or no, enslaved or formerly enslaved ancestors on your family tree. Um, but Eric Wells from Legacy Left Right, he's uh, previously been a presenter at one of our virtual conferences. He said, be okay with not having an exact date. Sometimes the best you're going to get is a year. And that's just going to have to be okay. Um, and document where you find it. And if it's a best guess, that's okay too. Uh, sometimes you're just not going to find it. But you've done if you've done your due diligence, diligence and you've looked at the traditional sources and you've gone to um, alternative sources like the ones listed and people have mentioned and you've done the best you can and all you get is a year then that's just going to be good enough what are my all next right. questions so monica wants to know what info is a must have when you're looking at alternative sources for instance she has a great great grandfather she has his name and the year range for death but that's it she's not sure if he was born or died in Texas or Mexico. Okay, so the question, uh, we have to, it depends. Everybody, everybody who's a channel member, it's time to drop your indep it depends icon. It depends on what you're trying to do with the must. If that's all you can track down, then that's all you're going to get. Um, one of the things in genealogy we have to recognize <clears throat> is some of us are just not fortunate enough to have relatives that had a paper trail. Um, if your ancestor was famous or infamous, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of records created by him. But if they were ordinary, average Joes and Joannes, sometimes there's just not a lot of records for them. So for must, you need a piece of evidence that they existed. So if all you get is a death date, that's okay. However, 
However, you can come up with some birth around. So let's say you have an article that says that he lived to be about 70 years old. All right, well then subtract that from the known death date and you have about 70 years before. Um, so my grandfather was, um, it was really great. Uh, he was born and died on the exact same day, 60 years apart. So let's say all I knew was he was born 60 years earlier. I could take 1978 and say he was born about 1918. The trick is, and WikiTree, for my WikiTree lovers, does this really well. There's ways where you can say this is an, let other research knows this is an exact confirmed birth date. This is a guess because there's no evidence and there's some other options you can tell other researchers that I've done my research and I can't find anything. This is the best guess that I have. So that's kind of nice. If you have the ability to do that on other platforms and I highly recommend it. All right. So um, this is on 100. I have a seven and eight generations back mm -hmm. with my research, but now not finding birth and marriage records at all in England. I'm using family search, my heritage, find my past and coming up empty okay any advice well so for England um, you know if you're seven or eight generations back you're talking about 1800s 1700s and, and before you're not gonna have birth records all you're gonna have is uh, the baptism records um, and the marriage records that are gonna be recorded by the church now for that you need to know what parish they're in because there wasn't a great big index of everything it was all kept by the parishes. Um, and some of those parish records are online, and some of them are on the different sites, and some of them are on individual parish websites. Uh, so the one that I'm thinking of to go to to take a look is the English Parish, English Parish Clerks, English Parish, English, something like that. Somebody from England helped me out here. There's, there's BMD, that's what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. um, birth, marriage, death, or baptism, marriage, death. Um, there's, a, there's websites that will give you links to some of these different parishes where you can go and find out where their parish records are kept and just recognize that since some of them are not online, the only place you can do is take a vacation to England and go and look in their archives for them. Yep. Or hire somebody such as uh, through Trace or some of our other professional genealogists. I do need to throw it out there that um, after this stream ends, I'll have a link, but it's already over in the blog. If you do reach out to Trace, let them know we sent them, it sent you, and they'll give you a $50 off whatever package you buy from them. So pretty neat. All right, so um, there was Greg. He said the options on WikiTree to identify a date, and it doesn't have to just be the birth date. I saw this on multiple dates. About uncertain, exact certain, before this date. Yes, I love that. And after this date, because those come in very handy. Sometimes you know that your ancestor was born after this date because they had an older sibling and you know when they were born. Um, sometimes you know it's before because you know the sibling after, and right? Um, I didn't see a between, which would be kind of handy. And somebody said that my heritage had a lot of great options. And I believe when I was using them recently, they had a between option where you can put, they're born between these two dates. And that's really neat. <clears throat> Other questions? Um, so this one I may, you may not know about. Uh, this okay. is from Crystal. And she's talking about um, slaves from Puerto Rico in, specifically. Mm -hmm. She says, I found a record showing a first middle name, age, where he's from, and slave owner's name. Oh, cool. I'm not 100% sure if it's my ancestor. Any tips on confirming this? So first thing that comes to mind when I think of Puerto Rico is Puerto Rico was not part of the United States until the Spanish-American War, right after the Spanish-American War, right? I don't know. Okay. I'll have to look it up. Would you <clears throat> like me to? Yeah, okay. because then what we're looking at really is before this time. So you... And Puerto Rico at that time was part of Spain. So there might be... You got it. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing with, with records like that is to recognize is that while some of these records may be in Puerto Rico, depending on how that record set was made or what that record set was intended for originally, it might actually be back in Spain 
that you're looking for that record. Now, I'm not familiar with Spanish records at all or Puerto Rico records in particular, um, and so I don't know, but that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, let's see. 